How's it going, everyone? It's Ideas of Ice and Fire. In just a little while, I'll have LML on here. But first, you know, I'm going to read this section from the world of Ice and Fire that talks about a shy. And so that is how we that is how we will start this live stream off. And then after that, I'll get Lucifer on here. And then we're going to discuss a shy and its people and all the things that go along with the shy, including the shadow and all that. So let's get right to that. And so we come nearly to the end of the world, or at least the end of our knowledge. Easternmost and southernmost of the great cities of the known world, the ancient port of Ashai stands at the end of a long wedge of land, on the point where the Jade Sea meets the Staffon Straits. Its origins are lost in the mist of time. Even the Ashai do not know who built their city. They will say only that the city has stood here since the world began and will stand here until it ends. Few places in the known world are as remote as a shy, and fewer are as forbidding. Travelers tell us that the city is built entirely of black stone. Halls, hovels, temples, palaces, streets, walls, bazaars, all. Some say as well that the stone of a shy has a greasy, unpleasant feel to it that seems to drink the light, dimming tapers and torches and hearth fires alike. The nights are very black in a shy, all agree, and even the brightest days of summer are somehow gray and gloomy. A shy is a large city, sprawling out for leagues on both banks of the Black River, Ash. Behind its enormous land walls is ground enough for Valantis, Karth, and King's Landing to stand side by side and still have room for Old Town. Yet the population of Ashai is no greater than that of any good-sized market town. By night, the streets are deserted, and only one building in tin shows light. Even at the height of day there are no crowds to be seen. No tradesmen shouting their wares in noisy markets. No women gossiping at a well. Those who walk the streets of Ashai are masked and veiled, and have a furtive air about them. Oft as not they walk alone or ride in palakins of ebony and iron, hidden behind dark curtains, and borne through dark streets upon the backs of slaves. And there are no children in Ashai. Despite its forbidding aspects, a shy by the shadow has for many centuries been a thriving port where ships from all over the known world come to trade, crossing vast and stormy seas. Most arrive laden with foodstuffs and wine, for beyond the walls of a shy little grows save ghost grass whose glassy glowing stalks are inedible. If not for the food brought from across the sea, the Ashai would have starved. The ships bring cask of fresh water too. The waters of ash glisten black beneath the noonday sun and glimmer with a pale green phosphorescence by night. And such fish as swim in the river are blind and twisted, so deformed and hideous to look upon that only fools and shadow binders will eat of their flesh. Every land beyond the sun has need of fruits and grains and vegetables, so one might ask why any mariner would sail to the ends of the earth when he might more easily sell his cargo to markets closer to home. The answer is gold. Beyond the walls of Ashai food is scarce, but gold and gems are common. Though some will say that the gold of the Shadowlands is as unhealthy in its own way as the fruits that are grown there. The ships come nonetheless, for gold, for gems, and for other treasures. For certain, things spoken of only in whispers, things that cannot be found anywhere else upon the earth save in the black bazirs of Ashai, the dark city by the shadow is a city steeped in sorcery. Warlocks, wizards, alchemists, moonsingers, red priests, 
black alchemists, necromancers, aromancers, pyromancers, blood mages, torturers, inquisitors, poisoners, god's wives, night walkers, shape changers, worshippers of the black goat and the pale child and the lion of night, all find welcome in a shy by the shadow where nothing is forbidden. Here, they are free to practice their spells without restraint or censure, conduct their obscene rites and fornicate with demons if they desire. Most sinister of all sorcerers in Ashai are the Shadowbinders, whose lacquered masks hide their faces from the eyes of gods and men. They alone dare to go upriver, past the walls of Ashai into the heart of darkness. On its way from the mountains of the morn to the sea, the ash runs howling through the narrow cleft in the mountains, between the towering cliffs so steep and close that the river is perpetually in shadow, save for a few moments at midday when the sun is at its zenith. In the caves that pockmark the cliffs, demons and dragons and worse make their lairs. The further from the city one goes, the more hideous and twisted these creatures become. Until at last, one stands before the doors of Stagai, the corpse city at the shadow's heart, where even the shadow binders fear to tread, or so the stories say. Is there any truth to these grim fables brought back from the end of the earth by singers and sailors and dabblers in sorcery? Who can say? Lomas Longstrider never saw a shy by the shadow. Even the sea snake never sailed so far. Those who did have not returned to tell us their tales. Until they do. A shy and the shadow lands, and whatever lands and seas might lie beyond them, must remain a closed book to wise men and kings alike. There is always more to know, more to see, more to learn. The world is vast and wondrous strange, and there are many more things beneath the stars that even the Archmaesters of the Citadel can dream. An account by Archmaester Marin confirms the report that no man rides in a shy, be he warrior, merchant, or prince. There are no horses in a shy, no elephants, no mules, no donkeys, no zorses, no camels, no dogs. Such beasts, when brought there by ship, soon die. The malign influence of the ash and its polluted waters have been implicated, as it is well understood from Harmon's On Miasmas that animals are more sensitive to the foulness exuded by such waters, even without drinking them. Septon Barth's writings speculate more wildly, referring to the higher mysteries with little evidence. And so we come. So that is what the world of Ice and Fire has to say about Ashai. And let me see if I can get uh, Lucifer on here now. Can you hear me? Yes, and I'm I'm just pissed off there's no Zorses. <laughs> What the hell, man? We want Zorsis, people. Like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting, though. Zorsis. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, reading the books for the first time, who sees a Zorsis? Isn't it Ari Arya in Harrenhal or something? She sees a Zorsis or somewhere? Yes, I think that's correct. I remember reading that, and I was like, what the fuck is a Zors? Like, I was like, what is that? I didn't, I didn't know what he was talking about. I'd never heard the term Zors before. And then I, like, Googled, and I was like, oh, a zebra. That's it's what a mean. zebra. It's a zebra. <laughs> lizard, lizard lions or crocodiles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Zorses yeah. are zebras. And uh, what's the other one? There's one other like imaginary animal that seems to be a real animal. Oh, well, I'll think of it later. Um, yeah. I'd... There's a few, I think. But yeah, a shy man. The creepiest place in all of Planetos, right? You know. What was George so Martin? Go the ahead. very first thing that strikes me when you read that description are two the two things that are probably uh, the least disputable facts about a shy because we don't know much for sure like it's obviously 
written so that we're, we're not sure and it's mysterious and hardly anyone's been there but we know it's the biggest city in the world and we know it's entirely built of greasy black stone yes. and you could just start with those two facts and kind of think about them and learn a lot of things i think man this is clearly a place that was built by non-humans as like this this is this is this this was built by some other race of beings and it was not built by human hands i just don't think so it's otherworldly it's not this is not even a place that i think is that's meant for like living you know organisms just like normal life like you bring animals here and they fucking die plants won't grow here the fish are mutated and fucked up like this is not a place where things are meant to be living so i don't i don't think that humans built this city i just don't so let let me let me throw okay so if it was built out of greasy black stone the way it looks now then i agree with you mm -hmm. however i think it's more likely that it was built out of stone that was not originally greasy and black and that it was built before a shy and the shadowlands were all messed up and shadowed that mm -hmm. is my theory that it basically the biggest city in the world was probably built by a wealthy and powerful civilization and it would have been built in that spot when a shy was a nice place to live mm -hmm. because that's where you build a big city like a capital city a, a dawn age metropolis if you will and if you look at their location on the map they're sitting right on the straits there and uh if the shadowlands wasn't some horrible toxic area that's a really great spot to be right on the you know the entrance to a straits just like karth basically they would have been very similar to karth as the gateway between uh east and whatever's or west and whatever's further east so this those, city that's... would have been had to be built by people that you know rivaled the wealth of like the the empire of the dawn i mean this is this would have been this is well in, yeah ancient ancient times like like the the first civilizations we're talking about the first civilizations that formed here like, so that's exactly my theory is that the great empire of the dawn built it oh that's, that's very exactly. interesting yeah that's what i think interesting i mean they're the they're the only really candidate you mm -hmm. know like we we're told the only thing we know about the great empire of the dawn really is that they were some great amazing civilization that's lost to myth that perished in the time of the long night mm -hmm. so you obviously you are of the opinion that the first dragon riders came from a shy right yes they came from okay, the shadow so, so the reason why i have connected and actually uh, my friend Dern Durndon made this connection originally but the reason why we think that the great empire of the dawn built a shy and that this was a dragon riding civilization was a quote in uh, that's from danny's wake the dragon dream Mm -hmm. in a game of thrones are you familiar with this one where she sees the kingly ghosts yes and they have swords of pale fire mm -hmm. yeah and you've mentioned that yeah so they have the four their gemstone eyes are four out of the eight um gemstones of the great empire of the dawn and they have pale hair like valerians uh and then they uh have the swords of pale fire sorry i'm pulling up the quote i should have done that mm -hmm. before i started talking there. okay ghosts lined the hallway dressed in the faded raiment of kings in their hands were swords of pale fire they had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white and their eyes were opal and amethyst tourmaline and jade faster they cried faster she raced her feet melting the stone wherever they touched and then they go on and that's where she hatches her dragon wings and flies through the door mm -hmm. and you know they're all chanting wake the dragon but the point is they have hair of silver and gold and platinum so obviously these are being shown to us as ancestors of danny when we first read this we probably just thought these were like ancient valerians or something right yes um but now that we know that opal amethyst tourmaline and jade are four out of the eight gems of the gemstone emperors it's pretty easy to actually connect them to those gemstone emperors instead and then you see that they have the swords of pale fire so that sort of indicates lightbringer technology now the, the weird thing is that we're told lightbringer was forged during the long night and we're told the great empire of the dawn came to an end when the long night fell so this almost indicates that maybe flaming sword technology predates lightbringer and predates the long night what do you think about that mm-hmm uh <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah, I, 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 
Yeah, um, I find it very interesting. I mean, that's something that I'd have to ponder more deeply, I suppose. Um, but yeah, definitely really interesting. I think... Okay, so... So to bring it back to what we were talking about, sorry, I, I, I sort of derailed it, but we were talking about the two different theories for a shot. Either it was made out of the greasy black stone, just like it is now, mm -hmm. or it was made before whatever disaster fell, which obviously would be the long night. And then it was... And then transformed, exactly. Transformed through some, by, by some means. Uh, right. So what, so what is your explanation for why the Shadowlands is the way it is? Let's, let's start with that, maybe. I think the Shadowlands is the way it is simply because it's it's a volcanic mountain and that it's ash and it's dark because of that. But then I also think that there is something living there. I think, you know, and I, I think there's something living there and something that has worship, worshippers that live there. Uh, because the city itself is referred to as the Corpse City, which uh, is a Lovecraftian reference. Uh, Relay, where Cthulhu sleeps, is the Corpse City. It's a direct reference, actually. And what's yes. interesting about it is that this place is called the Heart of Darkness, and then very far north you have the Heart of Winter. And it seems like, if you look at, depending on how you look at it, and the way that I kind of look at it, is that you have these two places like juxtaposed to each other. Absolutely. And, and that there may be two different things that oppose each other that live in both of these places. And then if you if you take it a little bit further, uh, Cthulhu is in an, in, an unending rivalry with another deity. Um, and his name is not meant to be other, uttered. Like, you can't say his name. His name is... Narlathotep, mm -hmm. I think, and you're not it's you're not supposed to say his name, and that kind of reminds me of you know the great other whose name is not supposed to be spoken. So um, I think it's that way mainly because his deity or entity keeps it that way. I think he has followers that have left the shadow, and I think Quaith is one of those people. I think she's masquerading as a shadowbinder, but I think that she is one of the followers of this thing that lives in the shadow that keeps this place black and that keeps nothing from living because that's also a theme in Lovecraftian mythology too is that you know like when this thing is around like in anything in the vicinity dies like in the color from outer space like a rock well a color from outer space lands on this farm and it poisons everything like uh, the so animals that, die man. uh plants can't grow the people kind of go mad something and so it kind of goes to that too okay so that's that's what i think George Martin has done here is that his version of Cthulhu sleeping in Relay is the black meteor that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped. Because, like I was about to say, in The Color Out of Space, the meteor actually turns the whole land gray and lifeless and basically sucks the life out of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's very similar to the description of a shy. Yeah. And there's also many Lovecraft stories where alien intelligence is communicated through a black stone or a meteor. Mm -hmm. So I essentially think that although Martin's not going to ever show us gods, quote unquote, he's not going to show us actual, his version of Cthulhu in a shy. I do think he's thinking about that idea. And I think it's the black stone that fell from the sky. You And you even said there's something that people worship. Well, he, here's the quote, all right? When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture and necromancy enslaved his people took a tiger woman for his bride feasted on human flesh and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky many scholars count the bloodstone emperor as the first high priest of the sinister church of starry wisdom which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world and this of course is the story of the end of the great empire of the dawn where the long night is basically blamed on the bloodstone emperor and they're mm -hmm. saying that his us usurpation and reign of terror was so evil that it literally caused the sun to hide its face mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this black stone that he's worshiping right at the time of the long night that's that's i think that's the smoking gun if you will this black stone was one of the meteors that caused the long night okay and i think one of those meteors had to have fallen in the shadowlands and that's why it's all dark and poisoned and toxic so okay. this black stone could be leaching the color 
out of the stone of a shy and turning it into greasy black stone essentially that's that's the theory okay i have a question for you but first i just want to say that the god that is supposed to oppose cthulhu is named hastar the unspeakable one that is his name uh okay so like so the cool. timeline is okay you've got the emperor of the dawn he leaves then you've got the bloodstone emperor he, does he create a shy like where does a shy like at what point in time no, no, is no. a shy so built so a shy is built up over a long time in, in my opinion this has to be the capital of the great empire of the dawn hmm. and essentially it was just the greatest metropolis it's atlantis basically and when the great empire of the dawn collapses when the long night falls that's when that meteor falls and basically it's like a big it's like valeria it's like a disaster and everything is turned toxic and poisoned and i think that i imagine like the meteor sitting in stigai in some sort of like corpse temple you know and it's mm -hmm. basically poisoning the land out from there out from the center so yeah. when they talk about the ghost grass eventually covering the earth that might happen once like that toxicness of a shy continues to leak out mm -hmm. i don't know <clears throat> Uh, and you know the evil spreads so to speak like it continues to radiate outwards whatever it is well see the thing with in in lovecrafty mythology like if uh these things they send like cthulhu for instance he sends out dreams to people and anything any if you sail near where he is he is sunk in the ocean you'll feel like a certain anxiety you know like you'll feel you'll feel like a kind of oppression and like there's a feeling there's something there's a certain energy that radiates radiates from him um and then there's totally. this there's a story that's written later i don't i don't think it's written by lovecraft but it's called the black stone it's about a stone that shows up and you know it's kind of you know poisoning the people and, um so yeah that that's definitely a, a lovecraftian idea i think uh and yeah the age so it's so old that they've forgotten they've they like they don't even or so they claim they claim to not know but do you think that you know the the origin of a shy is maybe hidden somewhere in the annals of a shy very secret knowledge and why would they be keeping it secret like why would they purposely be keeping the origin so <clears throat> if you think about the real world we don't know jack squat about what happened eight thousand years ago in, in specifics like we know a certain people was in a certain land and we can trace the flood myth back you know and say well all these people had this flood myth so maybe it dates back to this common ancestor or something but we don't know who the kings were or you know what i mean any of yeah. that stuff um we're starting to learn a little bit at gobekli tepe in turkey but the point is we don't know much and so the long night is in itself is like a cultural bottleneck yeah essentially when the sun hides uh that would create famine after a few months and when there's famine uh all power structures will basically topple because when people are starving riots will happen anarchy will happen warlords will happen and nothing then nobody matters will be able to, right so there'll be no power structure maintained uh, something like the citadel for example would not survive through a long night so what you're going to have is basically almost no record of whatever came before. Mm -hmm. And if we do have records, it would be some, yeah, be some scroll in some dark temple of a shy somewhere. And I think it's very possible that those records exist, but it's just like, who's going to go there and read it and then like read it back to the maesters. You know what I mean? Like they don't even trust Marwin anyways. Mm -hmm. He's the only person that would go and read something like that. So yeah. They might, they might, they might have record of it, but the way that we're going to find out would probably be Bran, you know, through the Weirwood Net, right? <clears throat> yeah. So, Melisandre is a character that is from a shy and also Quaith. And as Gray Area pointed out on Twitter the other day, you know, Melisandre says that she's from a shy, but there aren't any children in the shy, supposedly. So, uh, <laughs> That's very interesting. Are like the people there just not like how is it if there are no children in a shy, then how does its population remain stable so, or grow or anything? So my theory on that is that uh, regular people can't live in a shy for very long. Mm -hmm. It's a toxic environment. So there's no animals because animals couldn't survive it. And there's no children because children wouldn't live long there. And I'm guessing that the human slaves that live there probably don't live very long lives uh -huh. and so mostly what we have are basically dark magicians and shadow binders that are surviving there through magic 
And then you have people like Marwin who just go there for a short amount of time. Yeah. You know, I don't, I think maybe that's it. Like children are younger and more vulnerable and everything's toxic there. So they just really couldn't live there. And there's probably not like people don't live there in the normal way that people live in towns. I really think at this point, it's just a camp for dark magicians and people that train, you know, trade in gems and gold and dragon glasses. It's like told. a, it's like a big magic school campus where all the dark wizards meet up and trade goods and. Well, and, stuff. and this is why I think Ashai was built by regular people before it was all messed up because mm -hmm. you don't need to build the largest city in the world just to have a dark temple to learn black magic. Like a little fortress would be suitable. You know, you're right. Them. You're right because it, it does give off the sense that this was intended for a different purpose that was beyond what it is now. Well, not quite beyond, but something different, something entirely different. Like the size of this does not justify what it's used for. You know, so exactly, and it has huge land walls. Mm -hmm. So that indicates the city was built at a time when they expected enemies to come and attack them over land. Yeah, and that's just not a factor anymore. It doesn't even make sense. Who would attack a shy? Like, there's this doesn't make any sense. But if a shy was the uh, metropolis capital of a great civilization, then of course it would have huge land walls. Absolutely. Now, Ashai also is rich in gold and gems. I was just going to say um, that. So before it was all poisoned, it is the kind of mineral rich place that an advanced civilization would grow prosperous living on top of. Absolutely. So there is a super chat that I want to get to real quick. Uh, yeah. Dallas Lazarus asks, well, says, nothing much to add, but you two are the best of Song of Ice and Fire YouTubers, and I appreciate you. Thank you for enhancing my experience of the series. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yep. That's music to our ears. <laughs> I appreciate the praise. Yeah. So these gemstones and, you know, minerals are obviously coming out of the mountains. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that the World of Ice and Fire says that some say the gold is just as poison as, you know, the food that grows here, you know, or it's just as, you know, you would, you shouldn't take the gold because it's maybe cursed or something. I thought that was rather interesting that people believe that. And it's almost like you couldn't stop a belief like that from happening because you have a place like a shy, which is where all the dark wizards live and which is where, um, all the sorcery happens, you know, it's kind of like impossible for people not to tell like stories like that, you know, so you have to wonder to what extent are it, is it just hyped up, you know, because it seems like because from the world of ice and fire, it's like there are no laws here, you can do whatever you want, you could just find a random person on the street and take them in and do some messed up experiment on them for your witchcraft or whatever. So it, it seems, seems like that would kind of be, uh, uh, anarchy you know if you can just take somebody off of the street and torture them and do some weird fucked up sorcery on them so i don't i don't i don't know exactly do they have laws do they have like restrictions on who you can take to do this experiment or is it just like or is it you can only do this on slaves or like what is it there has to be some kind of system otherwise like no one would ever go to a shy do you get what i'm saying Yep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so the next next thing you you mentioned uh, was the idea that the heart of winter and the heart and the Ashai are are set up as opposites. So mm -hmm. I actually want to expand on that idea. I agree a hundred percent. And the key is this idea of what are the hinges of the world. So Melisandre in a Dance with Dragons says. I have dreamed of your wall, Jon Snow. Great was the lore that raised it, and great the spells locked beneath its ice. We walk beneath one of the hinges of the world. Okay, now the hinges of the world is a reference from uh, John Milton, who wrote in Paradise Regained, is uh, you know the sequel to Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. He wrote this, and either tropic now, gan thunder, and both ends of heaven the clouds from many a horrid rift abortive poured. Fierce rain with lightning mixed, water with fire, in ruin reconciled, nor slept the winds within their stony caves, but rushed abroad from the four hinges of the world, and fell on the vexed wilderness, whose tallest pines, the rooted deep as high, as sturdiest oaks, bowed their stiff necks, loaded with stormy blasts, or torn up sheer. So the language is a little 
screwy there and old fashioned, but basically the four hinges of the world are the four directions, like the four corners of the world. Mm -hmm. And they are associated with unleashing disasters um, and the, of the natural elements. So I thought that was kind of interesting when you look at the wall, you know, because that's basically the north is where the, the others and winter comes from. Yeah. And if you look at a shy, it's, it's kind of opposite. So here's the other quote about the hinge of the world. Uh, this is from Melisandre. She says, she was stronger at the wall, stronger even than in a shy. Her mm -hmm. every word and gesture was more potent, and she could do things that she had never done before. Such shadows as I bring forth here will be terrible, and no creature of the dark will stand before them. So what's interesting is that she says I, she was stronger here, even stronger than in Ashai. So that means that Ashai is also a place that amplifies magic power, correct? Yeah. I take that to mean also is that whatever is giving her that power in the north is at this point in time more powerful than whatever was you know feeding that power in a shy that's what it seems like seems so, like ice is winning right well so this is right um well i think that that's because of the whole moon disaster thing like if you look at all the fire magic in the story it's all associated with shadow and darkness instead of light really mm -hmm. and i think there's um are you familiar with the wheel of time yes I am. So you, so you know how they have magic divided into male and female halves? Sa and Sadin male, and Sadar. Right, and, and the male half is like poison. Corrupted. And so every male magician like goes crazy because it's like there's some stain on it. Yes. Well, I think Martin's doing a version of that where fire magic is, is twisted and darkened. Um, and, and ice magic is twisted too because it burns uh, like, like fire almost. But there's, there's some warping going on with the darkness and fire. Mm -hmm. uh, but so to, so to get back on, on track here, the point is that uh, Ashai seems to be a source of magic power, not as strong as the wall, but it's a it's a it's I would guess that Ashai has to be a hinge of the world, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like it. It's it's at the edge. It's constantly referred to as being at the edge of the world. And then you oh, the wall is also like the end of the world. Tyrion calls it. I'm, he says I'm pissing off the edge of the world. So, yeah, definitely two different hinges. I definitely see that. And then uh, in the quote that you read, there's two times when there is heart language used. Yes. Uh, so it says, let's see here. Um, Most sinister of all the sorcerers of Ashaya, the shadow binders whose lacquered masks hide their faces from the eyes of gods and men. They alone dare to go upriver past the walls of Ashaya into the heart of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, and then it says, Stigai, the corpse city at the shadow's heart. So this heart language twice makes it sound kind of like the heart of winter or like an opposite of that yeah i definitely think so um yeah well i think well it goes back to my grand game idea which is that you know these these entities are more or less playing a game and that there's one that's on side ice and there's one on the side fire and then um you know i think quaith is like a servant of you know the fire side and I think that the Fireside has an interest in dragons being in the world. And I think that's what Quaith was trying to do for a number of decades. You know, with Aegon V, with um, with Ares, the Mad King, and then with Nerys. And I think she succeeded in hatching those dragons with the Nerys. And so I think that fire is on its uprising now because ice has already been active for years. For several decades at this point, you have to assume... <clears throat> Because Craster has been giving his children to the <coughs> others, so ice has already been stirring in the land of always winter and moving, having time to gain its strength. And it seems like it seems like the side of fire is a little bit late. It's like they've been trying, but to me they failed over and over again, and now they're finally succeeding. Uh, and I feel like you know it's the pretty much you know the center of it is in a shy, and then the center of the ice side is in the far north. And I also think, yeah, the heart of winter. And I also think that this is in the book. I think that the children of the forest, a branch of them broke off. They went and they beseeched this god of ice and snow, which is mentioned in the world of ice and fire, that some of the wildlings worship a god of ice and snow. I think they beseeched this god that it transformed them into the others. And they marched on the realms of men and they kind of got out of hand. And then the other children of the forest that were remaining had to step in and fight their brother and back. And so that's that's how I think the others came to be. And I think it's, it's from that center in the heart of winter. And, you know, this figure is actually playing a greater game 
a grander game against you know this this figure that sits at Sagai in the Heart of Darkness. Okay, so do you think there are actually deities then? Uh, well, not not real deities, but I think um, I think that there are forces, <laughs> more abstract figures. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. closer to how I think about it too. Mm -hmm. Like, like fire magic. People who channel fire magic perceive a deity that's essentially the source of fire magic. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. almost how Melisandre describes him. Like he says, you know, the sun belongs to R'hllor, and the fires that warm our hearth, and the fires beneath the earth. All, basically, everything that's fire is a piece of R'hllor. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I guess when you start talking about like when uh you know the children of the forest went north and they found something i don't think they found an entity i think they found a source of power yeah i guess i'm more comfortable talking about it like that but i really don't think martin intends to clarify that i think he just is sort of using the general idea and leaving it up to us to sort of fill in the details you know yeah like i don't think any of the characters are going to hear the voice of god no, I don't, I don't. I don't see that happening either. I think this will always be something that's behind the scenes. And right, right. see, I think, I think you can or 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 can't just just choose whether or not you want to uh, say that you know this this source of power has its own will, or not even necessarily its own will. Just it's a nature, like a natural nature that like it when this this source is tapped, it will kind of affect things in a certain way and kind of work. yes make certain things happen in a certain way you know what i'm saying yeah so like, like the, the natural like so the source in the north would be the natural enemy of fire just because that's its nature it will always go against it it will always oppose it so i've also picked up clues that there might be a meteor in the heart of winter and that mm -hmm. that's actually what is the heart of winter as well the heart of a fallen star if you will mm -hmm. i haven't figured out what the deal is like if there's a white meteor in one place or a black meteor in one place or if they're both black meteors or whatever but there are some clues about there being a meteor in the heart of in the heart of winter so there's a lot of parallels between the idea of uh you know fire zombies and ice zombies and all that stuff and people wonder about there being a different version of others in a shy or in the gray waste and it could be that if these black meteors are what is sort of twisting all this magic and enabling some of this really horrible stuff it would kind of make sense if there's one in each of the hearts mm -hmm. you know um because if you look at the bloodstone emperor he worshiped the black stone but then he also did like necromancy and created human animal hybrids and like just did every kind of black magic that you can think of yeah i mean according according to legend he married whatever, a but... tiger woman oh know? my goodness how controversial <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a tiger a, woman, for Christ's well, sake. Well, that could, that might just be a god empress of Lang, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely well, possible, see. yeah. So, uh, let's see. Uh, so, a bunch of people are ax asking about the five forts in different okay. ways. Some people are asking, are the five forts maybe one of the hinges? Or what's the deal with them? Are they like the original wall to fight against some sort of other facsimile from the Grey Waste? Uh, go I ahead think and... so. I, I think... You've... I think that, you know, the Grey Waste, if you, if you keep walking, then you'll eventually have to cross an ice bridge that goes across the sea and into the land of Always Winter. And I think that the others have potentially come both ways before. And I think that's why the five forts were built to, you know, keep to, you know, for the, it's the same purpose as the wall, essentially, to defend, you know, to keep the Lion of Night, it, it says that, is to keep the Lion of Night from the realms of men. And I think the Lion of Night is just another great other. And yeah, I, I definitely think that the White Walkers came both ways. Yeah, I definitely think that's, it's possible they came both ways. And it's also very possible that um, there's just an equivalent of the others coming from the Grey Waste. Like again, if there's, if there's some sort of magical link, whether it's a meteor or just a certain kind of magic that's creating the others in Westeros and creating whatever demons come out of the Grey Waste uh, there, then it, they could just be equivalent beings. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but they could be the actual same beings, too. That's, that's both, uh, both possible.
Yeah, because that's why I think that the legends, the legends, like they, they come from all over the world, you know. And so I'm just thinking that, like, if they, if it, if the long night happened and they marched both ways, they marched into like both continents at the same time, that it would justify these legends being all over the place. Well, the others are really just a Westerosi thing, like the, um, I mean, yeah, so. In other places, they talk about the darkness, and but they all have different stories. And then in Westeros, you really have the tale of the others. But still, the five forts, to me, indicate that they were definitely fighting off something. They were definitely fighting off something that came out of the Grey Waste. And then I look at maps, and I just could see how it, how it would just fit so perfectly. Like, if I was looking at this on a globe, that it could totally come up the other way and just be connected by just, like, a little, a little like, frozen bridge. I see that happening. But yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot to think about. <laughs> but I think it's possible, definitely. So the other... So the thing about the five fourths, first of all, as far as the hinges of the world, I don't know that Martin is like thinking of exactly four and we can figure out which four they are. I mean, I tend to think he doesn't really work like that. Um, but uh, I, I shy in the heart of winter are the two that I think were being specifically shown these places are amplifiers of magic mm -hmm. all right so the five forts i don't know i mean maybe maybe not but the the main thing about the five forts and i think the reason that george put them in the story is because they're made out of fused stone and they're thousand like a thousand feet tall all he right? does so this say a, that they radiate a certain energy though there's like a feeling that you get a godlike uh something yeah, yeah, it's it seems bizarre, but the point is that they're made out of fused black stone, and fused black stone is something we recognize. We know how that is made. It's made by dragon lords with dragon fire and sorcery. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that the Valerians did all over the world in Valantis, Valeria itself, um, in Dra on Dragonstone. They can make walls, and the Valerian roads, you know, are basically thousands of miles long, flat as can be, fused stone. So when we see a few stone fortresses in the five forts, basically the first thing we know is that dragon lords have been here and the dragon lords built those things. Because again, we, we've been given the way to build few stone. We've only been given one way and it's a very specific way. So if you look at the five forts and then if you look at Battle Isle on Old Town, this is, these are the two things that we are told unambiguously these two things date from before the Long Night. The five forts were supposedly raised by the Great Empire of the Dawn, by like their third emperor thousands of years before the Long Night. And then Old Town, the few, you're familiar with that, right? The few stone fortress on Battle Isle? Yes. So that was supposedly found there by the first high towers that came there. And they built all of their subsequent high towers on top of that thing. Mm -hmm. And they got there before the Long Night fell, supposedly. So... These two things, the Five Forts and the Few Stone at Battle Isle, are basically as close as you can get to actual hard proof that Dragon Lords existed before the Long Night, both in Westeros and in Eastern Essos. And that is basically one of the big pieces that tells you the Great Empire of the Dawn was a Dragon Lord Empire, because they were the ones that built the Five Forts. Well, uh, well, Have you thought about all that before? No, but, you know, UT is based on, you know, real life China. You, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's pretty obvious to see, like, it's the oldest civilization in the world. China is the oldest civilization in the world. They invented writing before everybody else. You know, China has a lot of interesting dragon mythology. As far as, far as I know, I'm pretty sure they do. I'm not like an expert on Chinese mythology. But yeah, they have a lot of dragon mythology going on. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that E.T. could have possibly been the first dragon riding civilization. Well, so this is actually an important thing to talk about is the E.T. Great Empire of the Dawn discontinuity. So there's a key line at the end of the Great Empire of the Dawn story. Azor Ahai comes in, he saves the day. But then it says, the Great Empire of the Dawn was not reformed and the earth was broken and people went their various ways and became suspicious of one another. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the Great Empire of the Dawn disbanded. Mm -hmm. It fragmented. It, it, like I said, in the Long Night, any sort of power structure would have done exactly that. So 
what we have is Yi T essentially appearing after the Long Night. They were one of the civilizations that was like a children, a child. Sorry, children. <laughs> I sound like Chef from South. Hey, children, when he's talking to one kid. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, Yi T is basically. They are one of the civilizations that sprang up in the wake of the Great Empire of the Dawn's dissolution. And they are the ones that keep the story of the Great Empire of the Dawn. But they do not claim to be the Great Empire of the Dawn. They're sort of carrying their mantle. They're using the God Emperor title. And they occupy some of the main area that the Great Empire used to occupy. But the Great Empire occupied everything east of the bones. Yeah. So the Jogos Nai are probably descended of people of the Great Empire of the Dawn too. When you have an empire that's that big, bigger than Westeros, it's going to be a multi-ethnic empire. It's going to have people of different types in it. And so when it breaks up, those different tribes are going to form their own nations. And so Yi Ti is, is one of the successors of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So I'm not sure if any of the Dragon Riders, we don't know like how many Dragon Riders there were in the Great Empire of the Dawn. Probably not the entire empire. I'm not saying they were all Valyrians. I'm just saying that some of them must have been dragon riders and those would be the people that would be the ancestors to valyria okay so you know that's interesting because do you think that the reason that the people of yeti built um a shy is because they wanted to mine the gemstones and no 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 so that's what i'm saying is yeti did not build a shy a shy was built by the great empire of the okay. dawn thousands of years before the long night and yeti sprang up after the long night so the Great Emperor of the Dawn built a shy. Do you think they built it to mine the gemstones that were there? Like similar to Valyria, how like they they found the dragons and they they had all the gemstones and they. Um... I think that would have been one factor that played into the location of their empire. But if you look at great cities like Rome or Carthage, they start as a small place and then they build up and become wealthy because they're in a great spot and they have great resources and then certain events happen. And so if you look at a shy again, it's on the tip of a peninsula. So it's in a great strategic location to control the seas and the, the trade between the straits. And and a shy, the land is full of gemstones and gold. So if it wasn't toxic, then it would have been a great place to glyph. It would have been fertile. It would have been rich in resources. It would have been strategic for a sea trade. So that's essentially what happened is it wasn't like built to exploit the gems particularly, but that's one of the factors that made them rich and powerful. I would have to assume. Hmm. Okay. Well, I have got some Patreon questions that I got to get to. All right. Philip, of House, Philip, of, sorry. Philip of house Harris says, do you think all magic on the planet comes from a shy? Uh, what ancient, what ancient secrets, magic creatures, etc. Do you think still reside there? Um, I don't think all the magic comes from a shy, as we were talking about earlier. I think, you know, magic comes from a bunch of different places. Um, what ancient secrets, magic, creatures, etc. do you think reside there? Well, we know that dragons um, exist somewhere in the Shadowlands. And all sorts of beasts to make their lairs in the caves, according to the world of Ice and Fire. Um, as far as I can tell, I'm sure there are fireworms and, <laughs> and who knows what else, grumpkins, snarks. I don't know. Like, I, don't, I, I mean, I can't guess what George R. R. Martin would put there. But I think you can expect at least fireworms and dragons. What do you think, <laughs> Lucifer, about that question? Yeah, I definitely think that uh, that's a big clue that it's a volcanic area and that dragons, you know, are, are native to this part of the world, just like they were to the, the 14 flames. Okay. Next question. Paula Thompson asks, is Melisandre really from a shy... Um, um, well, I can't recall exactly if I'd have to go back and re-examine her, uh, POV chapter and figure out if she ever thinks in her head that she is from a shy or is, or if that's just something that she just says to people, because I'm not 100% sure if she is or not. I, I don't think really. I don't think it really matters where she was born. I think she's mm -hmm. from a shy, meaning that like she's lived there. That's where she got her power. That's where she was trained. She is of a shy uh -huh. at this point. I don't really think it matters where she was born. She was probably born somewhere in the East or I mean, anywhere, really. She was sold into slavery as yeah. a child. So it's not like so, she had a choice on where she'd go. Yeah. yeah, probably ended up in a shy after she was sold as a slave. 
but I just don't think it's going to be important. She's from a shy meaning that that's where she's been for the last, you know, century or two or whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> uh, all right. Now this question is extremely long. So, extremely. um, you can put some background music on to read it. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Sure. Shri Shri Yanish Jane. I'm sorry. Do you think that the use of blood magic, dragon glass on fireworms, wyverns, could have birthed dragons? It's canon, as in the world of ice and fire, Septon bars dragons, wyverns, and worms. He speculated that the blood mages of Valyria used wyvern stock to create dragons. Basically, fireworms plus wyverns plus a shy magic equals dragons. As many people do say that dragons come from a shy could this be a potential way other than being birthed volcanic regions for shadow binders to have experimented by mixing obsidian with wyverns creating the first fire breathing dragons upon coming up with this i was certain i wasn't the first person to come up with this and this guy sums it up pretty good and he leaves a link and i can't go into that right now um excerpt from dance of excerpt of dragons wyverns and worms in Septum's Bars, dragons, worms, and... Oh, God, this is so frustrating to read. In Septum Bars, dragons, worms, and wyverns, he speculated that the blood mages of Valyria used wyvern stock to create dragons, though blood mages were alleged to have experimented mightily with their unnatural arts. This claim is considered far-fetched by most maesters, and Maester Vannin's against the unnatural contains certain proofs of dragons having existed in Westeros, even in the earliest days before Valyria rose to power. Alright. <laughs> that was a very long question. So basically she's just asking, what do you think about the origin of dragons? Yeah. Right? I mean, and yeah. she's throwing a specific theory about using obsidian. Is that what, she, is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that the dragons were created using obsidian and quote-unquote a shy magic by um, doing something with fireworms and wyverns and creating dragons. Well, and, if you ask HBO, they would say yes, absolutely, because Dragon Glass does everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I tend to think that, you know, that humans haven't really had anything to do with dragons. I think dragons are just something that have naturally Yay. existed in this world. I don't think Me that neither. people created the dragons. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think so. I think humans created the dragon bond, mm -hmm. whatever whatever that is, the blood of the dragon, the ability of Targaryens to bond with dragons. It's not just a matter of feeding them mutton every mm -hmm. day. I mean, that's definitely a way you can tame an animal. But I think it's pretty clear that the Targaryens have a magical bond with dragons between all the lizard babies that they pop out and between uh, just their consistent ability to bond and ride yeah. with dragons. You know, the we got that. I saw you tweet about yeah. this, but we got a new bit of info in the Sons of the Dragon that uh, incest was more common among dragon riding families in Valyria. Mm -hmm. And so I, it's definitely a, a bloodline purity thing. There's right? something going on. I thought it was interesting that Aenys, right? I think like when he when he got his dragon, then he stopped he stopped being a sickly. Like he got stronger. And until his mother died, then he got sickly again. But like when he had his dragon, like he, it made him stronger. And I thought it was interesting that it also said that amongst breeding, dragon breeding families and dragon riding families, they practice incest a lot more. And it was definitely due to something like keeping the bloodlines pure. And I also think that Daenerys kind of has that similar connection with her dragon eggs too. That you know they give her strength and she gives them strength, and that was part of the yeah. reason that they were able to be hatched in the first place. I think. Yeah. Yep, and uh, to address a, a question from the chat earlier, uh, sorry, I forgot who asked it, but somebody was talking about, you know, are there really different kinds of magic, or is it really just all blood magic or all one kind of magic? I would say the fact that a fire sorceress like Melisandre is made stronger by a hinge of the world in the far north that's made out of ice tells us that all magic is common on some level, whether it's like the same energy source that manifests through ice or fire differently, uh, or like really it's just uh, corrupted green seer magic that's gone the way of ice or fire. Like that's kind of what your theory is about the, about the others is that they are, their origins are in green seer magic and that somehow this transformed through ice, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it could be that the dragon bond 
is the same thing, a mutated form of skin changing and green seeing. I, I think that's highly likely to be the case. I'm not sure of it, but. Yeah. What do you think about that? A link between dragon riding and skin changing. You think that's uh cuz we're told that the dragon riders who came to Old Town that built the few stone fortress were given the idea that they might have come to learn the magic of the children of the forest. So maybe that had to do with creating the dragon bond. Potentially, but I think I think these people that came to Old Town and that came to Valyria, I think they were from the shadow. And right. I think from the Shadowlands and um I mean, I, I don't know. They could have gotten it from the Children of the Forest, or they might have had their own ways to bind themselves to dragons. Whatever the case, whatever it might have been, I think they, they're they definitely the ones that taught it to the Valyrians. I think they definitely taught it to the Valyrians, whether they got it from um, the Children of the Forest and Greenseer magic, I, don't, I can't say for certain. Yeah, so I think that so like it's fun like me and you are both people that like to nerd out on mm -hmm. the darker elements of the story and the backstory and the world building and the references to external mythology and all that stuff but ultimately of course all of this only matters in like how does it can it, how does it frame the story yes. how does it serve as context or foreshadowing for the main story and i think i think the whole point of sticking that few stone fortress on battle isle and giving us all these hints about dragon lords from ashai and dragon lords that existed before the long night, before Valyria existed, is to tell us that these dragon lords came to Westeros. And it's the same thing with Azor High. It's like Azor High is this legend from the Far East, from Ashai. And they're talking about it all through Clash of Kings on. And it's like, well, what does this myth from the Far East have, what does it have to do with Westeros? Yeah. And obviously, it's easy to look at the last hero and his dragon steel and be like, well, maybe that's the same story somehow underneath of it but what we need is how did people from a shy like azora high come to westeros and do stuff that had to do with the long night or the others or any of it we need some sort of physical plausible mechanism for a shy people to come to westeros and that few stone fortress sitting there under the high tower is like the red flag telling you look dragon lords came here before the long night and built a fortress what else did they do you know mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe they learned the magic of the children of the forest. And it's just like, oh, okay. Now we have uh, an actual mechanism for, like I said, the dragon bond to be influenced by green seer magic. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to speculate that there may have been children of the forest in Essos, but if the dragon lords came to Westeros, then that's, that's easier to be like, well, maybe that's how. I want to say what's up to Order of the Green Hand. I see you in the comments. But yeah. yeah. What up? <laughs> so uh somebody is saying in the chat so danny can warg into her dragon so i don't think so i think the dragon bond is not exactly the same as skin changing we know that because we've been in danny's pov and she doesn't see through the eyes of the dragon however it has everything to do with the blood but the the dragon does like feel danny's pain when danny has an orgasm drogon snorts you know like there is definitely a connection i think drogon sensed danny her distress in the uh house of the undying in the house of the undying and then again in the pit when when he when drogon yeah. flew to her in the pit in marine so there's definitely a psychic link there but it's not it doesn't seem to be as explicit as a skin changer so there has to be some sort of mutation involved but but th that's the thing is like it's a fire thing now dragons are fire made flesh so i think to skin change a dragon is not the same as skin changing regular animals you probably have to be you have to have different blood or something, you know, to right? To quote Stannis, dragons are magic, you know, right? You get like, you can't just, not just anybody can do it. Like it's a, it's a different kind of animal. It's a different kind of animal. It's not just something that anybody can do. Uh, a lot of people take the quote, you know, uh, the three eyed crow to Bran, you will fly it to mean that he will work a dragon. I don't think so. I think that just, I think that refers specifically to the ravens. I think that's what that means. I don't think Bran will actually warg a dragon in this story. Because, one, I think it will be way too obvious. And, and George R. R. Martin is not the type of person that does the obvious thing, I think. So I think by having, you know, specifically that line, you will fly, and then to have, like, dragons, which is a big flying thing, and then to him for him to do that, I think it will be just a little bit too obvious. So I think it... And I don't think Bran could warg a dragon. I don't, I don't necessarily think that he could. 
Yeah, it's an open question. That's what I was kind of kind of saying. Like, if a dragon is fire made flesh, if a human tried to warg a dragon, like it might be like trying to warg a bonfire. It might like burn your mind or something. It might be horrible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, that's pure speculation. I'm not saying that's definitely true, but I think that could be. I think that's probably the case. I think that it's Daenerys' it's blood that's been saving her this entire time. If it wasn't for her specific genes. <clears throat> I think that and then she would have been dead yeah. multiple times. It like yeah, I, it was required in the birth of the dragons. It was required in the survival of the fire. I think. I don't think. I think it was one Mary Mazdor's spell, and then two, the dragons being present, the dragon eggs, and then three, the simple fact that she is who she is and that she has the blood that she has. That oh yeah, don't forget the, the don't fire. forget the comet, dude. Come on, man. And the comet. <laughs> and the comet. Okay, yeah. LML, and the comet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, yeah. Uh, somebody in the chat, my friend David Hunter, said, uh, let's see, what did he say? He said, uh, could be uh, classic fantasy seeping into my concept, but I read it as if the dragons have above animal intelligence. I would agree with that. And there's a hint about that in A Storm of Swords, uh, where um, Sir Jorah is talking to Danny, and it says, Danny laughed. That would be a wondrous sight to see. It's only a tale, Khaleesi, said her exile knight. They talk of wise old dragons living a thousand years as well. Parthenox. Wise old dragons. <laughs> and the other clue about this is uh, there's a line about um, Jorah talking. I think it's Jorah. It's either. No, no, it's Barristan saying to Danny, uh, the Targaryen dragons were bred for war and in war they died. And that makes you wonder, like, did they breed other dragons for doing other things? Like, think about the crew that paved the Valerian roads. You'd want a really tame, mellow dragon to pave the roads, right? You wouldn't want Drogon, hmm. right? I mean, can you can you see Drogon like working with the road road crew, like you know <laughs> what I mean, like painstakingly so paving the roads thousands of miles? Like, no, they they probably bred different dragons for building castles and roads that were not as aggressive. And then the war dragons would have been built for pure aggressiveness and strength. I think and I've I got think it. I've got it. In this insta guy, there's a big ass fucking dragon, the most ancient dragon, right? And he and he is he is he is the entity. He is the figure that's supposed to be Relore. He is the one that's been sending the dreams to everyone. And then in the heart of winter, there is Winter, who is a big ice dragon, and he's all, and he's the great other. And at the end of the story, these two dragons are going to fly out and they're going to fight each other. And it's going to be like, ice versus fire. The end. <laughs> That's is the, uh, is the ebook going to have those uh, special sound effects? Yes. <laughs> hey, so uh, Order of the Green Hand uh, pulled a quote for us. It okay. says, this is from Mel's POV. That was a lesson Melisandre had learned long before Shy. The more effortless the sorcery appears, the more men fear the sorcerer. So that makes it sound like Melisandre had a life, and then she came to a shy and learned magic, mm -hmm. and there was a life before then. So that that pretty conclusively makes it sound like she was not born there. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it does. And then yeah, I because why would she refer to wherever she was born instead of a shy if she's lived most of her life in a shy? This is where she became who she was. Like I'm especially certain if she's. Especially if she's more than a hundred years old, yeah. And like her life up to the age of seven is only a very distant memory. Yeah, like I'm pretty certain that she didn't have red hair before. I'm pretty certain that she didn't have red eyes before. I think, I think, she, I think she yeah, transformed. Just have, we have no idea, dude. We have no idea. I think she all. transformed. But maybe, then you don't know. Not. It's it's a it's a glamour <laughs> at work as well. So you don't even, you can't even say for sure. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We just mm -hmm. we have no idea until we're. Until we're shown. Until we're shown. I was kind of disappointed that we didn't get more about that in Game of Thrones. Like, because I know that the point of her being old was something that George R. R. Martin, it was a plot point that George R. R. Martin gave them. But then it was just kind of shown that one time and then never brought up again. And I was really disappointed by that. I was hoping to see, get a little well, bit the, more. But yeah, but the fact that we got one Mel POV in ADWD means that uh, we'll get, we'll probably get another in TV. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm so. like because like in the POV chapter is is, <clears throat> is absolutely brilliant. 
Uh, if you haven't even read the books, just go into A Dance of Dragons and read that chapter. It'll give you a lot of insight on Melisandre and the way she thinks and what she's actually doing. Because a lot of people have this idea that Melisandre is a bad guy, that she's like evil, but she's totally not. She's misunderstood. She thinks that what she's doing is the right thing, but uh, she's having problems in the way she's interpreting her visions. Um, she's kind of like putting her own beliefs onto it and projecting her own beliefs onto what she's seeing instead of just seeing it for what it is, which is what Makoro does, and that's why it tends to be more accurate. I, I would say that um, if you look at the visions that Mel gets, it's hard to blame her for interpreting them wrongly, except for in the sense that the only thing you can blame her for is acting certain when she shouldn't. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Like she does a pretty good job of trying to interpret. Like if if you were seeing these visions, you wouldn't know what the fuck they meant either. No, <laughs> you know but she, I mean? like... she she supposedly has more training than anyone in her entire order, though. So I'm just like for for like for her to be boasting about how she's better than everyone else. I'm just like right. So part doing... of the misunderstanding that people have of Melisandre that George is talking about is the fact that. This is just the nature of trying to read the future. Mm -hmm. It's not an exact science. Yeah. Um, I do buy the idea that maybe Makoro's better at it, um, but he also, maybe he didn't know exactly what would happen. He just knew that he would survive. Mm -hmm. He saw himself being rescued on a boat after floating in the water. And so he knew that he would be carried out to sea and be rescued and that would be the way he needs to go. But he didn't necessarily know it would be 10 days and that the ship would be this. He probably just saw a vision of Victorian since Victorian is obviously important, but yes. it's it's just, it's hard to say, you know, it's hard to say. Like, well, Melisandre is just, like, going out on a limb more, I think, more than anything. I mean, yeah, because she does, she does kind of have to make decisions at a pace, at a rather quick pace. But, you know, what I find interesting about Makoro is that when he reappears, that he looks different, that he's, like, darker, and his, tatch, his tattoos have changed. Like so, something, something. Really, I didn't, I didn't notice that. Yeah, his, his, like his, his, his. They're described as two different colors. I'm pretty sure they go from either red to orange or orange to red, and his skin gets darker. It oh, becomes, I didn't it becomes like all. the color of almost charcoal. Yeah, I thought that was always how he looked. No, he got, he gets much darker. Like Tyrion sees him one way, and then when he shows up, Victorian sees him, and he's, really? he's, he's, he's different. Yeah. Hmm. Look at that. That's. Never noticed that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Melanie Patrick says George R. R. Martin is a better historian than some historians. That may be true. I do got another Patreon question that I need to get to. Too. This is another semi-long question. Um, what caused the shy to become the way it is? And I think we've um, talked about this a little bit already. This is slightly tinfoil, so please forgive me. My take combines points talked about in Preston Jacobs' apocalyptic video and LML's The Long Night video. So you probably agree with this because this is part of your theory. Perhaps a shy is the sole survival, su survivor and facing waves of nuclear winter due to, large, due to a large comet landing long ago in the land of always winter. Due to a potential shockwave blast of the comet, it could be facing a high level of magic, as we know that comets equal magic, as seen with the Bloodstone Emperor slash Euron. This could have caused the White Walkers to also grow their magic powers due to the magical powers of the comet. This can also be why magic is stronger in a shy. Okay, that's kind of multiple questions in one. Well, she's... she's uh... I mean, yeah, that's a lot of what I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier. The, the, the general idea that a comet or meteor is a source of magic, and they can be a source of dark magic, and if one were to fall and land in the heart of the shadow or the heart of winter, that it could very well be responsible for some of the wacky things that we see happening. That's pretty, it's really not crackpot at all. Like you said, mm -hmm. if you've read Lovecraft, then it's, it's a very basic Lovecraftian idea. And in classical mythology, meteorites are always venerated as holy objects because they fall from heaven. You know, yeah, exactly. And they're strange. Like the, they're a metal compound that's not found on Earth, and yeah. it's super heavy. It's you know, it's, it's remarkable. Of <clears> course, <throat> it's definitely something that would inspire awe and even worship, even in the real world. Like it, like when something something falls out of the sky and it's just a strange thing that's nowhere else on the Earth that no that's no one ever that's no one that no one has ever seen before. 
Yeah, that that that's the type of thing that does inspire religions and worshippers and cults. All right. So I got another Patreon question. Joe Haynes Poe Honan. Please talk a little about Patchface's quote under the sea, meaning in a shy, and what it means for the riddles under the sea the birds have scales. So you're saying that under the sea means in a shy. Um I've heard a few different inter interpretations for under the sea. I tend to think that it's um I think I tend to think that it actually means under the sea. I think that Patchface was given by the drowned god drowned given to the drowned god he was drowned and you know there are stories they talk about him being saved by merlings i think that he was saved uh and i think that he was resurrected in the way that the ironborn are but he was like he was actually killed and brought back by the drowned god i think Patchface was brought back to life by the drowned god and when he says under the sea he literally means under the sea so that's just my so, interpretation of it i definitely think it's a metaphor um, all that stuff is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree that he he definitely was a water resurrection. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty conclusive. He was under the water for days. Yeah. You know, he died. He definitely died. <laughs> yeah, so Emma Smith is a... Yeah, so there's a, there's a brilliant poster, one of my friends on the Westeros.org, called Ravenous Reader. And she has discovered that under the sea is actually referring to uh, green seers. Like instead of the green sea is an S E A, the green ocean sea, it's actually the green C S E E. So everything that's happening under the sea is actually talking about inside of the weirwood net, essentially. So for example, when it says the crows are white as snow, that's talking about the origin of the others as an opposite of the black brothers coming from the weirwood net. Because we all know that, like you, like your theory says, the others come from green seer magic, the children of the forest. Obviously, that involves weirwoods. So that's just one example. You can go through the whole thing. And basically, like the fish having scales, that's talking about dragons being involved with the weirwood net and Azor High, And there's a bunch of other stuff. I don't really want to go into all that because it's a huge, uh, a huge thing. Oh, yeah. But... We'd be talking about that for hours. <laughs> But and there's and there's other people that think it refers to just north of the wall. So like the crows are white as snow. It just means the others are like the equivalent of the of the, the black brothers north of the wall mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. So that's also another good theory. A lot of it lines up when you think about it that way, too. But it's one of the greatest puzzles in the books. Honestly, it's so it's such nonsense that you have to assume there's hidden meaning there. Right. Um, Patchface <clears throat> is definitely predicting things. Like, as soon as, like, the very first chapter, he says, The shadows come to dance, my lord. Obviously referring to Melisandre. Uh, he called well, he... Melis Melisandre, but also the others are white shadows. Mm -hmm. And so the shadow dance, I think, could refer to the shadow babies and the others both. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, he also calls out Mesa Crescent. And, and um, he says, clever man, but clever, clever fool. Now, I think he implies yeah. that he's more, he says, I'm more clever than you. I know things that you don't. That's what he he's does. saying to Crescent. Yeah, he definitely does. You know, uh, Patchface is definitely fucking creepy as shit. <laughs> I wouldn't have him around my daughter if I don't know why Stannis chooses to have this guy around his daughter. Like, it was, I mean, he just seems unsafe. Like, he's a big, you know, mentally handicapped guy. You know, I wouldn't... That's just weird anyways. You know, that's, that's odd. But whatever. Yeah, Under the Sea, No One Wears Hats is one of the m more mysterious ones. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, not quite, I'm not quite sure what that one means. No one wears hats, dude. The hats float away. You can't. You can't wear a hat. It'll just. Swoop. Yeah. Johans says uh, it means that no one wears a crown. Like there's no kings in a shy. Interesting. Okay, I got a couple more patron questions. Like two more. All right. To go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. And to touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. Uh, we've seen this quote at time and time again, but essentially I want to delve into it and the implications of how it hints at how Planetos is connected and also delve into the picture below. I can't show the picture, sorry. My question essentially is, what is east of Ashai? How far till we hit Westeros? Uh, if we go by the linked image and mention in your videos as well, the connecting land would be the land of always winter, making Arya's question of what's west of Westeros be... Uh, an undiscovered part of Ulthos. 
I think, uh, I think that's probably, I think that, you know, to go east, to go west, you must go east. I think she's telling Daenerys that if she just, if she simply goes the other way, she'll end up on the other side. That's just the way globes work. Um, so what's, what's, um, what's east of Ashai, uh, Westeros. I mean, if, if you're, if you're, if well, it's the a globe, east it's of, Westeros. East and north. Mm -hmm. really yeah so somebody somebody did the um the rough math and figured out that if you know based you can sort of see where the equator is mm -hmm. based on the 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 climate of the map you know somewhere just south of valyria probably yeah and and using that math you can sort of create a globe and you can see that basically from a shy to dorn is approximately halfway around the world so mm -hmm. if you sailed west from westeros it would be something like trying to cross the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. before you found anything. So it could yeah. be a really long way. Um, it's here. probably easier to sail the conventional way from Westeros to Ashai because there's many places to stop on the way. Mm -hmm. So when whenever people talk about the whole like, oh, well, did the people from Ashai sail east and get to Westeros that way? I mean, maybe, but it's more likely they went the conventional way. It would just be easier. Yeah. But the nearest does have dragons, though. So if she did want to, if she did want to get, the, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, it depends. I don't know. Well, I don't. I haven't seen. I haven't seen the map. I haven't seen the globe reconstructed or or anything. So I'd have to take a look at it. And it's, it doesn't need to get all technical. I mean, you can sort of see that it looks like about halfway around the world. Uh -huh. So you imagine that from a shy, you'd have to travel quite a bit of ways <clears throat> around to get to Westeros, going east. Now, the thing is, the Northern Passage is different. Like, conceivably, um, you have to keep in mind that the northernmost part of the Grey Waste and Mosavi is only parallel to the Erie. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to go east from the Grey Waste, and then you'd have to have land that goes north several hundred miles, you know, to get to where you could have a Northern Passage. So it would have to be pretty off the map if, if there is one. Mm-hmm unless you just want to say the map is inaccurate and it's really farther north than it looks, but there's no, like, the jungles of Mosavi aren't snow-covered, neither are the Thousand Islands. When you go to Ib, you get a little bit of snow and northern climate, so I, I think the map is approximately accurate. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess as accurate as a flat map can be. Uh, right. So... I've got one but final hey, question. What, oh, go what? for it. Yeah, and it's not a it's not a song of Ice Fire question. True Blue asked, "Have you watched Rick and Morty? They've got some deep Lovecraft lore happening." Yes, I've seen Rick and Morty. It's fantastic. New season was great. I like Rick and Morty a lot. You know, it's got like the cosmic nihilism going on, which is definitely like a Lovecraftian idea that you are nothing. You are nothing in the face of the cosmos because there's like infinite Ricks and infinite Mortys, and neither of them mean anything. So. Yeah, I like Rick and Morty. So what were you going to say, LML? Oh, well, just I was going to throw out one of my favorite theories, one of my pet theories that I, I think I came up with it, is that um, basically Marwyn is going to bring a glass candle and Daenerys is going to use it, and then that's how Daenerys is going to go to a shy, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. All right, have I mentioned that on your show before? Yes, you have. All right, well, I just want to mention it again. Yeah. Because I think it's going to happen. Because George R. Martin has said that we're not gonna we're not gonna visit a shy, even though Jorah Mormont keeps saying let's go to a shy to Daenerys for some reason. Well, it seems like in the early books he was thinking that they would go to a shy, and then he changed his mind about mm -hmm. it. it. Seems to be the the consensus. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the point is that we can accomplish the same thing by Dana using a glass candle to yeah. catch some glimpse of a shy. We can get the secrets and then not tear away the mystery. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we don't need a POV pulling up to the dock and like getting off the boat and all that stuff. <laughs> and I don't think we're gonna get one. So <clears throat> no, we're not. Yeah, so. George R. R. Martin has pretty much said, you know, there's not gonna be, we're not going to a shy. So yeah, but it's but interesting to other, talk about though. Yeah, that's the other major way of you could get some exposition besides weird net vision. So the people that live in the in a shy, there is there's sorcerers and necromancers and aromancers and pyromancers and every type of mancer that you can imagine. And so we talked about earlier that it's more likely that, you know, people come to a shy, they spend some time there, and then they leave and they live somewhere else. So it's not a city that anyone like really lives in. 
uh, you might have property in a shy. Probably at the, I, I, I would assume, reasonably wealthy to have property in a shy, maybe. Like to, I don't know. But um, you have a property in a shy and you go there and you do whatever you need to do. So I was talking about earlier about um, how exactly their laws could potentially work. Uh, you know, when dealing with sorcery, could you just like go in someone's house and steal their baby and do some weird ritual on it and be free of consequences? Because it does say in the world of ice and fire that nothing is forbidden. You know, so that seems like it would just be total chaos constantly. Like, would it not? I mean, I don't see how that could work. I don't see I how think it would. Well, it would be chaos if like normal people live there. But I think the only people that live there are like dark sorcerers and like the slaves that those people own and probably not a whole lot else i mean uh -huh. the only things we ever hear about are miriam asdor and marwin going there to basically learn magic why would you even go there if there's the potential that you could just be snatched off the street and used in some like well you probably have to go there with a little bit of knowledge and protection i would think i mean miriam asdor says she traveled there by caravan mm -hmm. um so I would do, assume that has to do with trading for... Do you for think there rare. would be um, some etiquette amongst sorcerers that, you know, they don't do certain yes. things to each other? Probably. Okay. And I and you just... Because you never know, like, who you're messing with. Mm-hmm. Your retribution and all that, you know? That would make sense, you know? Because I, 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 would, I, would like, I would like something in a shy, but at the same time, I, I don't because I don't want the mystery to be spoiled. Um, so... I think it's more interesting to talk about what could potentially be going on and the way things work. Um, like yeah, well, we, we, we can cross our fingers for the Quave uh, POV, qu the Quave prologue in uh, Dream of Spring or something. There's so many questions <laughs> to be to be talked about there. Like, does it have like a? Is there a mayor of a shy? Like, does it have like? Does it have some system of law that like or like property laws or, or something like that? Or like, how does anything really work? You know, I think I don't. I don't think this is ever going to get explained. But it has to no. run on some sense, like a regular city, in some way. I think, otherwise, nothing. Maybe I'm, it's just like the Church of Starry Wisdom. Like, mm -hmm. if anybody steps out of line, they'll you know they'll just slap you down. Mm -hmm. It could be. It's very interesting, though. I mean, it's just like I don't think you go there if you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, that's. <laughs> it's not somewhere that I would want to go. No, definitely. It's like, it's like the Valyria. It's kind of like Valyria, but went, but, but like the extra dark version of Valyria. But then again, we don't really know how dark the magic got in Valyria, really. Like, we know that all of it was rooted in fire and blood, which seems pretty dark. You know, just, just saying that, yep. it implies that there is, you know, sacrifice necessary for Valyrian magic. Well, I'll tell you what, if Bran is eating Jojen in a bowl, which I then, think we're, the, then weirwood magic is pretty messed up, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, like I'm, I'm 100% sure that Bran is eating him, because that chapter is full of is full of you know sacrifice symbolism. Then you know. oh man, are you familiar with the quote where um, Jojen is sitting in the bowl of a tree? Really? I, I oh yeah. <laughs> no. Let me find this for you. It's so great. I, you know how I am when I start looking for um, foreshadowing. You know, I key I key in on uh, like uh, key phrases or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Jojen yeah, paste. This, yeah, this, so... Uh, okay, it said, uh, The three-eyed crow, thought Bran, the green seer. It's not so far, he said. A little climb and we'll be safe. Maybe we can have a fire. All of them were cold and wet and hungry, except the ranger. And Jojen Reed was too weak to walk unaided. You go. Mira Reed bent down beside her brother. He was settled in the bowl of an oak, eyes closed, shivering violently. What little of his face could be seen beneath his hood and scarf was as colorless as the surrounding snow, but breath still puffed faintly from his nostrils when he exhaled. So, like, you get this idea of a pale face in a wooden bowl, uh -huh. and the weirwood bowl is a wooden bowl with faces on it. Yeah. White faces, like Jojen's white face. Yeah. So it really sounds like Jojen's in a bowl here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt that Bran has eaten Jojen. He even looks at it and he's going, oh, that looks like blood. And then Joe just not around, and then at the end, you see, the last thing that you see is someone being sacrificed before a werewolf tree, and Bran can taste the blood. I mean, it's all there. The moon being in, like being a crescent, like as thin and sharp as the blade of a knife, and then the same blade, you know, sacrificing the guy. I mean, it's all over the place. 
I mean, I don't see how you can't agree with Jojen Paste. It's like one of the most obvious ones for me. The only question is whether or not they're just like bleeding him a little bit or whether they literally threw him in a blender. Man, Jojen says like, like right before that, you're not the one that should be afraid. Like, so he knows yeah. that his death is yeah. coming. He knows. Like, he, so he's too. seen it. He has seen it. And that's why he just, he's lost the will to live. He's not fighting anymore. He's like, he's, he knows he's never getting out of that cave. He knows. And I think that if he thinks that it would save Bran, he knows that he's already dying, right? He's sick. He's dying, right? So I think that he would probably think that if, like, I'm going to help save the world, then I'm willing to make this sacrifice. And he's kind of resigned to his fate at this point. So he's like, okay, I'm fine with dying. But it's still fucked up, though, that they're doing this without even telling Bran. They're just like, here, eat this. By the way, you just ate your friend. It's like some Eric Cartman shit from South Park. Like, you're... They're eating your parents, you know? Pretty fucked up, Children of the Forest. Mm. Yeah, so uh, basically, I, I, think, I think George looks at power uh, the same, whether we're talking about war or magic, is that mostly it leads to some pretty dark places. Yeah. I mean, human beings are dark. Like, just look at every civilization the way every civilization... Like, cruelty all... Like, cru like, look at how many times cruelty has just won out. Look at, like, the Nazis or, like, Joseph Stalin or just the Crusades or the Inquisitions or the witch trials. Like, people are dark. It is in the nature of humanity to kill. I mean, it is. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but denying that it's in the nature of humanity to kill is just, you know, erroneous. Because it clearly is. If it wasn't, it's not something that would keep happening over and over and over and over again throughout the existence of humanity. So just think about that. You know, we're horrible. Hey, check. Okay, so check this out. This, this is my uh, Easter egg for the day. Let me see if you catch this. All right, this is in A Dance with Dragons, Melisandre. This is a Melisandre chapter. Listen for the wordplay here. Your sister, Melisandre, put her hand on his arm. You cannot help her, but he can. Snow wrenched his arm away. I think not. You do not know this creature. Rattleshirt could wash his hands a hundred times a day and he'd still have blood beneath his nails. He'd be more like to rape and murder Arya than to save her. No, if this was what you saw in your fires, my lady, you must have ashes in your eyes. If he tries to leave Castle Black without my leave, I'll take his head off myself. You must have ashes in your eyes. Ash eyes. Ash eye. <laughs> <laughs> Mel oh from a shy has ashes in her eye. Yeah, I'm serious. Oh wow. I mean, I mean that's kind of like I mean, is, how far is that? Like if people were saying ash eye, I mean I don't know. Did, did they speak the common tongue in ancient shy? Well, well. So the okay now the, the, it's a joke by Martin, but the reason why I think it's intentional is because there's actually this archetype called the shy maiden. Uh -huh. And every there are several times in the story where there's a fire and the flames are described as being like a like a maiden or like a woman dancing, mm -hmm. uh, or like the Danny sees them in the uh, when she wakes her dragons she sees the flames that remind her of the women dancing at her weddings, um, in uh, you know or they she also sees fiery sorcerers okay so every time these flate uh, the flames are described as maidens they're described as shy maidens. Mm -hmm. And so you have this idea of a woman made of fire who's a shy maiden. Yeah. And and so basically the the maiden from a shy is Melisandre. With and she's a woman eye. made of right, who's made of fire. Uh -huh. And all of that further goes back to the ash tree Yggdrasil. And I know you're familiar with Odin and Yggdrasil. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a yes. whole thing about um a woman that comes from the ash tree, which is a weirwood. So there's that I go into that in my Weirwood Compendium series, which is one of the things I've been waiting for you to work your way towards, and so why I keep bugging you to listen to that one. Okay. But there you go. <laughs> well, yeah. Speaking of that, check out LML's channel if you haven't already. And, yeah, don't forget to, like, look at my Patreon, too. There's exclusive content up there, you know. And you can just donate a dollar and get all that exclusive content. So check it's that so out, easy. too. It's just yeah. so easy. It's so easy. I mean, I don't know why you haven't done it. And I don't There's know no why excuse. you haven't subscribed to LML either. Like, that's really yeah, come on. And I bet most of you haven't even liked this video. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, Slackers. I'm honestly disgusted. Come on. 
Like the hound, <laughs> the hound would rape your fucking corpses right now. Oh, you know, okay. He'd be raping all of them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, I don't want to get in Jason Momoa trouble, but whatever. Everyone has their. Diff- everyone has their. Diff- I mean, how many times have we heard "hit that like button, people"? So you know, we're just trying to mix it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Threaten you with corpse rape. <laughs> it's a great line written by George R. R. Martin, by the way. Any man dies with a clean sword, I'll rape his fucking corpse. George R. R. Martin wrote that episode. Yeah. Just know that. I'm gonna oh, look- that's what you're referring to. I thought you just pulled that out of thin air. I thought you were all twisted. No. Okay, that makes a little more sense. No, I'm not as fucked up as George R. R. Martin. I don't come up with okay. stuff like that. Well, okay. nobody's as fucked up as George R. R. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look at the chat now and take some chat questions. So, like, if you guys got some stuff to say, throw it in there now. Got some more questions about a shy or anything. Any a Song of Ice and Fire stuff. Here's a good one for, by uh, Vaporizer. Why is it a shy by the shadow? What is the shadow? It is certainly not the shadow, the landmass next to a shy. A shot, right. So it's like the shadow is the central thing. He's kind of making the point. And I, this goes back to the, my whole idea about there being something in the heart of the shadow that's corrupting everything. Um, because what's funny is that the heart of winter is, is bright and it's guarded by the, the, the aurora borealis, basically. Curtain of light at the, the end of the light. world. And so the curtain of light is just like the inverse of the shadow that clings to everything around a shy and makes it dark. So that's why it's called a shy by the shadow is because the shadow is the thing that governs the entire landmass. Yeah. It's like it casts a shadow on a shy. It's meant to make a distinction. It's meant it's it's so that you know that a shy is one thing, the shadow is something else. The shadow is this place beyond, this thing beyond. And I thought I think it's very interesting that Quaith announces herself as Quaith of the shadow and not Quaith from a shy. Just say no. She says I'm from the shadow. Quaith of a shy. Oh, Quaith of the Shadow. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. Q&A. I feel that the Starks could be Ice Dragon descendants. Of oh, the Great Empire of the Dawn. Okay. Due to the dragon scales on their direwolf sigil, could this explain the possibility of Dawn slash Ice M plus A equals J and D when Ned meets John? It's like four theories referenced in one. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me uh, field that one, I guess. Um, I do think that uh, the Great Empire of the Dawn people coming to Westeros contributed some of their bloodline to House Stark because I think Night's King is tied to Azor High, and I think the Starks come from one of those Night's King babies that didn't get turned into an other or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's likely to be a connection and I've also, on my latest podcast, I've been talking about how the others might be, uh, you know, some sort of dragon lords or fire people that transformed into ice magic, or that there's some element of fire magic uh, involved that's been turned cold, essentially. So I've been talking about them as ice dragons, sort of symbolically. And so she's basically saying if the Starks have a connection to dragon lords in this distant past, does this have something to do with? Uh, the idea that Dawn might be the original ice, which is something I just talked about in my last theory. So, uh, um, yeah, maybe. That's basically the short answer is that, yeah, it could. I, I don't know about I the, don't think the so. direwolf sigil, but... No, the di- that was designed by HBO. Like, that's like... That's not... Yeah, I don't... I wouldn't think about that too much. Mm-hmm. But... but, yeah, I, I mean, as far as the Starks being descendants of dragon people, I mean, I don't think so. Like, I don't see that being a thing. I think that Jon Snow is the dragon connection, if anything, in the Stark family. Yeah, my my theory is that it was Night's King who was like the late the later stage of Azor Ahai's life, essentially, mm-hmm. or like the son of Azor Ahai, and so he was a fire person, quote unquote. But when he gave his seed to the Night's Queen, then the things they made were, were cold because the Night's Queen was basically a, a cold woman. And so my theory is that the others might contain like the cold transformed version of what used to be fire magic or dragon Lord blood. But then, then, so then the house Stark, you're familiar with the idea that house Stark descends from a night King baby, right? 
Um, or, I've heard or from that. another baby. Or from another baby. Like, depending on what you think about the timeline, I guess. I mean, yeah, because I, I thought I would I would have thought that House Stark was much older, was has existed before the time of the Long Night. So when I say founding of House Stark, like, I mean the, the founding of like Winterfell Starks. Like, I would I would say like so think about um. Okay, so think here's the easy way to explain it. Think about Gilly's baby. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, Craster. And his wives are, are giving their male children to the others. They're sacrificing to the others. And that basically means they're giving their male children to the others to be turned into others. But one of those babies doesn't get turned into an other. It gets, it gets rescued by Sam and Gilly. And then what they plan to do with it is they plan to take that baby and pass it off as Sam's child. And so that baby would then be in the position to uh, inherit Horn Hill if Sam's older brother dies, which he probably will. Yeah. Now, I know they did the baby swap and all that, but I'm just saying the original plan was to do that, mm -hmm. okay? And John, when he thinks about marrying Val, he thinks about adopting um, Monster as their child. And so this sort of is showing you how a stolen baby that was supposed to be turned into an other could eventually contribute their bloodline to a famous house. So that's kind of what I'm saying. It's like the Starks descend from one of, of, of a baby that was supposed to be turned into the others. And this is why the Starks have some sort of tie to ice or ice magic or anything like that. That's kind of what I'm thinking about. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I see another question. Q&A, do you think that... Do you think the others and the White Walkers are different entities and the Neverborn refer to the White Walkers? I think Neverborn, others, and White Walkers all refer to the same beings. I don't think they're different beings. Do you have anything to say about that? I mean, I don't think they're different. I'm familiar with the theory that there could be a third tier of other that we haven't seen. Um, okay. I don't know if I... Uh, it's an interesting theory. I can't rule it out. I'm, I'm curious as to what it means. Somebody suggested recently that Neverborn could have something to do with like shadow babies or um, not shadow babies, but like think about the babies that Craster gives to the others. Are mm -hmm. those babies turned into others or is, is there some sort of entity or presence that's basically taking over the baby? So imagine like tree spirits from the Weirwood Net taking over those babies with their intelligence. So then it would be like they were never born. They sort of just body snatched their way out of the tree. Uh -huh. That's a theory that I heard about. <clears throat> like like the uh, or or you think about Stannis's seed that he gives to Melisandre to make the shadows. Those seeds are never born. They get turned into shadows instead. So like the life the life force that goes into making the shadow is never born, perhaps, but. I don't know, man. It's just so hard to know. Like, I guess you could say that, but I tend to, I tend to think that because when is Neverborn mentioned? I've seen that I, Neverborn was mentioned in, in the that, outline. In, in the that outline. original outline. Yeah, yeah, he calls them Neverborn. Yeah, I tend to think that that was just. I tend to think it's all just referring to the others. Like, yeah, honestly. it might mean nothing at all. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, as as far as I, as far as what I can tell. Okay, Q There's and A. a Go There's ahead. a guy named Voice of the First Man that has a theory about that, if you mm -hmm. want to look that up, on the All last right. hearth forum. All right. Could Lightbringer be made from the very same meteorite that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped? Um, yeah. Yes. I mean, potentially. I mean... That's what I think. Uh, that's your theory? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> that's exactly what i think happened yeah i, I mean, think we had two magic swords black and white black meteor white meteor dawn versus lightbringer mm -hmm. that's what i think happened okay let's see okay the same way the dragons are a metaphor for nuclear weapons do you think that lightbringer is a metaphor for knowledge and bran is Lightbringer because of his access to the Werewoods. Um, that's an interesting take. I mean, Lightbringer, um, Lucifer, Illumination, to be illuminated. I mean, yeah, that could be viewed as knowledge, I think. The unveiling of new information. So I could see it, I could see it that way. 
But as far as Bran being Lightbringer because of his access to the Weirwoods, um, and so so Bran would be the metaphorical sword to be wielded against the others. I mean, I haven't. Yeah. Yes, the Burning Brand, mm -hmm. actually. The name Bran, in addition to referring to crows and ravens, also refers to flaming swords and flaming brands from Norse mythology. Uh, there's the Bran Stalker tree that, that a sword is pulled from. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, there's there's a whole... And I have an episode, Weirwood Compendium 2, A Burning Brandon, so where I, I explored that whole concept. I think sword, the word sword, that implies that something is wielding you know, this sword. So would would something else be wielding Bran? You know, the Children of the Forest, the... the, the I mean, you know... It's it's weird because Martin equates swords and people so often. Uh -huh. Like the Night's Watch of the Swords in the Darkness, the Sword of the Morning is a sword person, the King's uh -huh. Guard are called White Swords. You know what I mean? So, like, it's hard to separate that out. The sword and the person are kind of the, one and the same uh, in certain times. But the, to go back to the question, which is a really good question, there is um, Lightbringer represents the concept of the fire of the gods. And that refers to meteors, but it also does refer to the weirwoods and to knowledge. And the big clue about that is um, in the world of ice and fire, talking about the Grey King. And it says, the deeds attributed to the Grey King by the priests and singers of the Iron Islands, are many and marvelous. It was the Grey King who brought fire to the earth by taunting the storm god until he lashed down with a thunderbolt, setting a tree ablaze. So he stole fire from a god. So that's the fire of the gods. It comes down like a thunderbolt. And what does it create? A burning tree. Mm -hmm. Now, a burning tree is probably a reference to the burning bush of Moses. But the important thing is that the red leaves of the weirwood canopy are called once um, a blaze of flame. And the rest of the time, they're called bloody hands. And we know that blood and fire are kind of go together in the story. So the weirwood tree can be perceived as a bleeding and burning tree due to its description. And we're, so I think that when they're talking about setting a tree ablaze, and this is how we took the, the knowledge of the gods, this is all a metaphor for the weirwood net. Because what does the weirwood net do? It enables man to possess the fire of the gods, the knowledge of the gods. And I think this all ties into the Lightbringer mythology as well. So... It's a great question, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like a counterpoint. Like the two versions of the fire of the gods are the weirwood trees and these flaming swords, essentially, or these meteors and their flaming swords. Okay. Two-headed metaphor. Mm -hmm. I like it. I don't hate you, Order of the Green Hand. You rock. <laughs> I was reading one of the co one of the comments. Q and A: Is the rest of the known world relevant to the story of the Song of Ice and Fire? If not, do you think we will ever get separate stories set in those areas? I'd like to. I'd like these mysteries solved. Uh, I think you can give up mostly on mysteries solved. I don't think I don't think George R. R. Martin particularly likes to solve anything. And as far, if you mean the extended world, like uh, Ulthos or Sithoros. Or Othoros, I don't think that really has anything to do with the main Song of Ice and Fire story. George R. Martin has said, however, that he does want to write more stories that take place in this world. So, who knows, we might get a story that takes place in Sothoros or something. Um, but I think we just showed how some of these uh, things in the back of the world book are actually relevant. Like, everything we've been talking about in Ashai has to do with the Zorahai and dragons and whatever happened in the War for the Dawn in Westeros. So even though it's far flung and it's on the other side of the world, we well, know Zorahai yeah. has some part to play in the story. I didn't so, mean yeah, a it's... shy. I didn't mean a shy. I meant like the, I meant the, you know, I meant like Sothoros and Othoros. Because Jordan mm -hmm. Mart even said that, you know, they, when he was making the map books, that they were just like draw more areas and he just kind of like drew mm -hmm. extra stuff in there to extend the world. Right, so, right. So I think what he's already shown us, like Essos and Westeros, that that's what that's what's relevant to the main story. To the main song of Ice and Fire story. Do, do. Okay. I do think um I do think the this one of the best stories in the world book is the journey of Nymeria mm -hmm. when she flees from the Valerians and then goes to Sothorios and then the Summer Isles and then to Dorne. 
that I was hoping they would choose that, and this is a Shea's idea from History of Westeros, that they would choose that for one of the new TV shows. Because you could have like the first season with them fighting against the Valerians and then escaping, and then you could have a season or two in Sothorios, like Jamestown with weird fucking uh, brindled men or whatever else they got and stuff, and then uh-huh. the Summer Island, the Summer Island season, and then finally getting to Dorne and the Unification War to win Dorne, like. That would have been a good five season TV show. Yeah. I would have liked that a lot. I know I'm rooting for ET. Everybody knows that I that I want ET to happen. But I feel like ET would probably be very, very fucking expensive. So I don't know. But that's the one that I want. I want ET. Cause I just feel like I just want to see the designs of the buildings and I just want to see the the And when I when I say ET I mean the Empire of the Dawn. I just why well, I I feel I feel like something could be written to you know like solve some of the mystery. I think I think that it should happen, you know, sometime after the Don Emperor has already ascended or whatever, so you can see the decline of ET and how it kind of fell into chaos. Uh, and I think that's where some of the conflict could come in. But yeah, that's just me. That's my pipe dream. But of course, most people. And I think it's something interesting that people would be interested in, you know, because it, it's different enough so that it's like a new thing, but it's because, you know, it's like the Asian side of Westeros. Well, it's not Westeros, but it's like Asian Westeros kind of, and it wouldn't just be like the same kind of like, oh, it's medieval again. It'd be something new. It would, I think it would catch new eyes potentially. Yeah. Here's a good question by Sarah Sin- Sinamo. Q&A, do you think that the ultimate goal of Euron Greyjoy is to follow the path of the Bloodstone Emperor? Could Euron be a Bloodstone Emperor reborn? Yeah. Well, he is trying to marry an Amethyst Empress with dragons. And I think I think that... Um, and probably use her as a path to power, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the similarities between Euron and the Bloodstone Emperor are everywhere. Bloodstone, Blood Eye, I think it's basically the same concept. I think... Yep that Euro wants to be worshipped as a god, it'll end, it'll, it'll end like, he, he'll meet his demise in the end. But I think that's very much what's going on. He's, <clears throat> he's the second coming of the Bloodstone Emperor. Hey, so you know that, that scene where all the gods are impaled on the spikes of the Iron Throne? Yes. I know you know it because you just read that chapter. Yes. Um, so the one god that's missing from that scene is the old gods, right? Mm-hmm. Except for... There's a bunch of burning trees in the background. Oh, ah. I didn't notice that. That's very yeah. interesting. Well, yeah, it doesn't stand out until you make the 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 uh, connection between the burning tree of the Great King mm-hmm. and the Weirwoods. But once I made that connection, it was like kind of it was a thunderbolt. It was getting struck by lightning. Really, it mm-hmm. really um, peeled away all the Ironborn Grey King myths. That's why I have the first episode of the Weirwood Compendium labeled "The Grey King and the Sea Dragon." Because the Grey King sea dragon myths have to do with the burning trees, fire of the gods, oh, and also petrified weirwood bones. So, like, there's a there's a lot going on there. Mm-hmm. Gretchen, stop trying to make Yeti happen. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> who's, no. Who's Gretchen? It's Mean Girls reference. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, she's like, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not gonna happen. And, like, she keeps trying to, like, make this random slang word be a thing and everyone's like no (laughs) but yeah man yt needs to happen guys you know it you know you know you love it you want it you all fucking want it just just admit it petition hbo and be like we want yt you know we need thousands of people tweeting them at all times and we don't want brad pitt cast as the lead we want asian actors come on oh god it reminds me of fucking great wall like holy shit like fucking Talk about fucking white man comes and saves the day. I mean, I mean, I can, uh, I don't want to go on a tangent, but like literally Marco fucking. Marco Polo was, was kind of annoying too. Literally fucking, you have these Asian people that have been manning this wall against these fucking aliens or fucking whatever for like fucking centuries or some shit. And then fucking Matt Damon gets there and immediately he's like, have you ever thought to capture one of them? And they're like, oh yeah, we never fucking thought to capture one of these things. I'm just like, oh my God. It's just like, as soon as he gets there, he solves all the problems. But these people are just apparently idiots that have just been sitting here. Like, I'm just like, oh, fucking stupid. Shit pisses me off. <laughs> but yeah, that's a movie that you don't go to see. Should go see Mother, though. You know, Mother, Mother, 
Like, Mother has some parallels with the Song of Ice and Fire, I think. Very much uh, nature <laughs> themes, you know, angry mother nature themes going on in Mother. Like, but Mother will piss a lot of people off. It's not like a, it's not something that like I think is for a mainstream audience. But it's basically about the theme of, you know, how mankind treats nature and what's gonna happen when nature is finally fucking fed up with the shit. And you know, it's it's good. Oh, that's like cool. It. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, somebody made a good joke here. Uh, Brandon Parker, says, have you tried the new of Game of Thrones drinks? Ut. <laughs> and then someone else says official Ut bags. <laughs> Someone needs to make that. I should make that merchandise. I'm gonna sell ye tea. Ye tea tea. Ye tea tea. <laughs> Get yourself a glass of ye tea tea. Soothing. Yeah. And we'll come up with bloodstone flavored eventually. Okay. All right. So we're gonna take a few more questions before we sign off here, guys. So throw them in the chat. I'm looking at the chat now. So if you got anything else to say, now's the time. Now is the time. Now is the time for your questions. Hey, let me throw a little quick observation from the uh, the new book, the uh, Sons of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, Visenya at one point mounted Vagar and burned five castles in the Reach in one night. They glossed over it really quickly, so you may not even remember it. It was literally two sentences. But just think about that. Mm -hmm. One dragon, one dragon lord burned five castles in one night. Fucked him up. That's the kind of thing that I think might be stuck in there to tell us this is possible. Mm -hmm. you, you follow me? Like, You know what really, when I was reading that, what really struck me? Like, I was, I was just like, oh my god, it's so fucking epic. It's when they're outside of the Eerie and they're like, okay, how are we going to fucking do this? And then fucking Magar shows up on fucking Beleriand, the Black Dread, like out of nowhere, like he finally claims this fucking dragon, and he's just like, rah, like that shit was fucking epic as shit, man. I was yeah, just like, was. yeah, that was yeah. cool. Like I love how George R. R. Martin just gives me those fucking chills, like reading that I literally got chills. Very interesting story, by the way. If you haven't picked up that <sighs> anthology, Sons of the Dragon is, it's a good, it's a good read. Good it's read. a good read, and and uh, what I'm coming to notice, especially on my second read through, is that. While your attention is drawn to Magor and Anis, the main characters are actually the women in mm -hmm. the story. Like um, Visenya. Like Vis Visenya and uh, Reyna. Reyna. And um, Anis' wife, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. And uh, Taina of the Tower. There's a lot of pretty interesting female characters that are sort of like... You, you have to remember, it, it's all written from a maester's point of view. Yeah. which means patriarchy and and bias like that but you can see between the lines that there's some really strong female characters here that went through some really interesting things and held stuff together so the Senya cool. in particular is very interesting to me <clears throat> because i mean of course she wants her son magar to be you know like number one so i, I thought it was really because she's she never stops being a fucking badass like fucking even when she's just the dowager like she never fucking stops and she's still got her fucking dragon and she's fucking total badass. I really, really enjoyed learning more about Vicinia. And then Rainey's, of course, was short lived. But um I thought it was interesting, uh Magor was conceived right after Rainey's died, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was Let's very see, do... we got some questions here now. Q and A is Moat Kalen harboring residual magic from the children. Or I would expand that question and just say, is there, what's the story with Mo Kalen and is there magic hanging out there? Um, potentially, I guess. <laughs> I don't really have a concrete, an concrete answer. Well, I pulled that, um, I pulled that quote last week about the fine black oil that Theon sees. Yeah, and you know, how it's, like, slippery. Yeah, so if, the, if Mo Kalen is oily black stone mm -hmm. and that's pretty yeah pretty interesting that would imply that there is some magic going on because every other time that the oily black stone is mentioned it's 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 got some kind of arcane roots it seems like um uh, okay. yeah so think about this all right like mo kalen it's supposedly built by the first men but it doesn't match anything else that the first man did very different. the construction style matches yin 
And if you look at the state of disrepair Mount Kalen's in, it looks to me like it probably was built before some great disaster, probably like the Hammer of the Waters incident, which I believe is tied to the Long Night and because, uh, you know, meteor impact or whatever. Mm -hmm. So to me, what I'm seeing is like a, a, something that was built before the Long Night that, that fell down during the Long Night. And that was, if it was built by first men, it wasn't built by the first men that we think of. It was built by the first men that existed before the Long Night, the same people that built like Storm's End and the Wall and other things that are hard to explain. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe it was Squishers. <laughs> it was Squishers. Night Pasta, I agree. Vasenia is very badass. Yes, True Blue. Quentin be dead. He's dead. I know people think he's alive, but you know, he's Ugh. dead. He's Ugh. dead. Why, people? Why? Yeah, I've heard so many different Quentin is alive. I don't know why people want to keep him alive. That's 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 my thing. Like, why do you want him to be alive? Was he really just like so cool? Like, because Quentin is just kind of that guy. Like, okay, I kind of want you to succeed, but then if you don't succeed, then it's kind of I kind of also don't care. So it's like I don't know. Um, Lucy Lestat asks you and me, what do you think of all the deformed children that Magor had? Danny had one like that too. We mentioned that earlier. I think it's just evidence that the Targaryens actually do have a blood bond to dragons that we don't understand yet, but that's that's a real thing. And it kind of leads to mutations in certain instances. Yeah, it's it's like we're told about the Valerians practicing human animal hybrid creation on Gogasos in Sothorios. So that's that's a pretty big clue that there are ways to crossbreed humans and animals. Tiger woman horrific. Yeah, exactly. Tiger Woman, or it's the Squishers, or the people of Toad Isle, are like the half winged, human. The Winged Men, yeah, the Eyeless Men. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of clues that 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 can happen uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Because I mean, the Children of the Forest are arguably something a little bit other than humanoid, and they can reproduce with humans. So, Ghost of High Heart. See, I have a theory <clears throat> that the Ghost of High Heart is actually Leaf's daughter. I think that Leaf. She says that she lived in the realms of men. For a number of years, I mm -hmm. think that she. I think that she became pregnant. And I think that the Ghost of High Heart is her daughter. I think That's that. Cool. I think that she lives. And I think that Jenny of Oldstone was actually the Ghost's daughter. And I think that's why she feels enormous pain when she thinks about Jenny. Yeah, daughter or maybe even granddaughter. Yeah, I can yeah. See. So yep. that's just basically my idea. So I think it's time. The time has come to wrap things up, guys. Thanks everyone for watching. Check out my Patreon. Give this video a like if you've enjoyed the entire thing. Likes really help out. Uh, LML, give your outro. Outro. You can find outro. You can find all my stuff at LucifermeansLightbringer.com. I've got a Patreon. I've got podcasts. I've got essays that match the podcasts. Uh, you can find it all there. And then I've got a YouTube channel, which is just Lucifer Means Lightbringer on YouTube. And I will be doing a live stream this Sunday which is a follow-up to my last two Moons of Ice and Fire episodes. We'll be talking about the others. So if you can, come by. That's going to be Sunday. Or not Sunday. What am I saying? Saturday. Saturday at 3.30 Eastern on the Lucifer Means Lightbringer YouTube channel. I use the same channel as you did, Quinn, just to keep it uh, easy. Uh -huh. So it's the normal Quinn time, but it's Saturday instead of Thursday. So come mm -hmm. on by. This Saturday at 3.30 p.m. <laughs> At Slummers, at SummerSlam. No, I'm kidding. But anyways, uh, thanks guys for watching. Like the video. Peace out. If you missed the beginning of this, you can rewatch it. It'll be on the channel. Um, like I said, give it a like. Check out my Patreon. Got all types of shit on there. Um, check out my thanks. Twitter. Follow me. Follow LML too. Facebook. I'm at the Dragon LML. What What are you? I'm a, I'm Ideas of Ice underscore Fire. It's on the screen right now. In case all my links are on the screen at the at this very moment. Peace out, guys. It's been fun talking about Ashaya, the Dark City. The Dark City. It's kind of like a bigger version of maybe like Cahor. You know, there's like stuff like going on in Cahor, which I didn't mention. I intended to mention, but I didn't. Peace out, though. Talk to you guys Thanks later. Thanks for everybody who came by. See you.